Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Before tonight, I, I, since I wasn't familiar with the tomb Geniza, I, I Googled it to try and see if I could familiarize myself with what that was. And I, come, I came across images of blue dumpsters and holes in the ground with stuff just thumped in there. And I thought, this is a garbage dump. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was awful. It was an awful impression. What did I miss? Okay, so in Israel, in many, many towns, it's like this blue uh, dumpster. It's like a place that can put only, you know, papers or something like that. Uh, and basically once a year, once, you know, a while that it's filled in. So the, you know, the state or the, the government or, you know, person that's in charge takes it and buries it in the ground. That's just a way to uh, basically collect all the all these uh, items. The problem that comes up in, I mean, in Israel, I think more than any other place in the world, is that every Shabbos, believe it or not, but there are these types of, of I don't want to call them newspapers, but type of papers that we give that you know people give out in uh, in shul and synagogue, and many times these uh, papers have uh, quotes from from the Torah. So if they have quotes from the Torah, there's a question or uh, actually a possibility that it needs to be taken to be buried in a respectful way, like we said, because it's a holy uh, uh, now it's a holy uh, uh, paper. Uh, so that for that reason, in many places we have all these you know blue dumpsters or. Uh, places to put to these papers because many people think that all these papers, all of them, need to be taken to Gniza. So try to imagine every week, sure. hundreds of hundreds of papers, people who want to take to Gniza. Actually, most of them, I'll say, let's say 90% out of, out of the pages there, don't really need to uh, uh, to be taken to Gniza. And just, you know, I mean, all the, the advertisements of, uh, you know, whatever they want to advertise in those papers uh, don't need to be taken to Gniza. So, you know, to, you know, solve that, they have all these pictures that you saw. So at some point in time in the year, there's a respectful parade of yes. trucks. All yes. these things. <laughs> Is that what happened? And I can tell you that there are many, many famous stories about old uh, synagogues, old places in the world. The most famous one is what we call Gnizat Ka'il. Okay, and yeah. how do you say it? Cairo. Cairo. In Cairo, uh, they found many, 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 many uh, uh, very, very old, uh, um, you know, Torahs. And uh, we have also Keter uh, Ramtsova, uh, uh, one of the, the most ancient uh, uh, Torah that we have today, they found also in Igniza uh, that we, you know, and, and what's beautiful about it that, I mean, it's a few hundred years ago, maybe more than that even, and it's still the same Torah that we use today. And it's always when I see that, it's, it's, it gives me the goosebumps that the same Torah, I mean, we would have expected that in 2000 years, things will be changed, you know, you know, things will always change. Uh, and if you want to to play the, the, the game, it's a very famous game in Israel, about the broken phone. Okay, people sit in, you know, in, in, a, in a circle and they whisper something in the, person, in the person's ear and they pass it around until it gets back to the first person that started it, he hears a totally different thing than what he started. Because when you pass on stuff, that's nature, things uh, change. And uh, thanks to this, this Gniza that we, uh, uh, people saved for many, many years, even though they were supposed to bury it, um, we, we found uh, uh, you know, proofs of, of very, very old Taurus scrolls that still have the same same exact tour that we use today, and I think it's it's amazing and fascinating. Yeah, I think I think you probably wouldn't have a pleasant experience if you went to a city morgue mm -hmm. as well. Right, right. I mean, everything that becomes commercialized is going to lose a little bit of that touch, exactly. unfortunately. Exactly. Yeah, but the, the need to re to handle it respectfully is is, is obvious. Moses. The revelation at Mount Sinai that changed everything. That's when the, the, the Medrash actually gives a parable. There was a you know the Roman king who didn't allow uh, people go people that you know pretty much like the Iron Curtain <laughs> existed, and then the decree was 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 annulled, and now you can go up and you can go down, and there's free travel spiritually. That that happened at when God comes down to Sinai. And Moses is told to come up to the mountain on behalf of the Jewish people. That's when the Iron Curtain comes down. That's when the division comes down. So that was the very first time that holiness was able to take hold in physical reality. So, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, when, when the first of the Ten Commandments, I am God, your God. Right? So, so, so we're told in the Talmud that Anochi is an acronym of four words. Ana nafshi tabit which means that I am writing myself into the Torah. Oh. 
That's an incredible concept. God is writing himself into the Torah. So, of course, the Torah becomes holy. Sure. God isn't playing games. Exactly what it means, you know, it's impossible for us to comprehend as human beings. But if God says it, that's what it is. So if we see godliness in that scroll that started out as being part of a cow, and now through, you know, through, 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 you know, through all the evolutions, but all by God's command. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but most of the Torahs that were written uh, in, the ni- in, 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 the, in the 2000 to about 2010 came from Omaha. There was a, yeah, there was a place downtown because the preferred material to be used for Torahs are shlil, which I'm sure Rabbi Yoni is going to talk about in a moment, which, are, which is, comes from an unborn fetus. So it's very soft and they're pure because they haven't yet messed around <laughs> in this world. So because they're pure and innocent, that's why they're preferred. So it was actually produced right here in Omaha. And from here, they would have to uh, you know, send it back to Israel. That's where they, they processed it. But from the very beginning of the process here, it had to be the button and the big vats where they were putting the lime and all that. And all those steps had to be done for the sake of the mitzvah of Torah or tefillin or mitzvah. And very, so all these things have to be done for that, that in mind. And only when it's done with that in mind, then you have a perfectly kosher, holy Torah. But that holiness is a process that happens because God said so. So you're right when you say your communication with God, but God is the one that writes the instructions. <laughs> so if you decide you're going to uh, you know, serve God through riding horses, which actually some people do, you know, they find their spirituality, but there's no mitzvah in riding horses. You know, you might find some, some, some uh, aloof stuff, but, but only what God tells us. So that's why, that's why when we're talking about a mezuzah, if the mezuzah isn't exactly the way the, the halakha requires that it be, then it's not a mezuzah. It's, you know, it's a nice idea. Uh, the Talmud talks about people who would, would put in all other types of kameas, other types of charms, and it, it's, it, it's not appropriate. You know, they might be great, but that's not the mitzvah. This is a mitzvah, it's a very specific mitzvah. 